Well, good morning. We're going to get started. Welcome. Hey, you know, usually every Sunday, not every Sunday, excuse me, last Sunday, I think, second service was a little more lively than first service. So I want you guys to beat second service. So good morning. Good morning. Oh, great job. We're glad you're here this morning. Uh, I noticed with all of the chatter and talking that it was a livelier group this morning. So we're glad you're here. It has to be. It's sunny out. Isn't it a great morning? Amen. We're excited you're here this morning. My name is Kyle. If you don't know me, happy that you're here. Uh, just a few things as we kick off church. If you are watching online or here, uh, make sure you click on the QR code in front of you. Let us know who you are. Say hello. We'd love to say hello to you uh, and, and just welcome you to our church. Uh, May 9th, coming up here in a little bit, we're going to have a child dedication. I love child dedication Sundays. Uh, it's just a special time for our church. So if you know someone that would like to dedicate their, their child, let us know. But just uh, highlight that service. It's going to be fantastic. Also, we also want to schedule a baptism service, uh, time to just celebrate what God is doing. And we, I love baptisms in our church because we get to celebrate uh, and hear testimonies of people uh, in their faith coming to know Jesus and how that came about. So if you haven't been baptized, let us know. We'd love to schedule you and get to you more information on that. And women, tonight is a Women's Connect event, Never Alone. So come at 6.30 tonight, 6.30 to 8, right across the hallway in the, in the fireside room. With that, would you stand as we start our service in a word of prayer? God, thank you for this morning, for the sun, all that you're doing. May you uh, just really speak to our hearts this morning. Allow us to sense uh, just that you are with us, God, which we know you are. But during this season, let us know you're with us. Uh, may we be excited for the word that Pastor James is going to preach. God, we just love you. Thank you for just a chance to be with friends and family here this morning. Uh, just be with our service. Amen. Amen. It's good to be here this morning. Yeah. It was good to be at men's retreat last weekend too, though. I'll be honest. It was a great, great time. We're just going to start out by reading uh, Psalm 100. It's just five verses. This is not up on the screen, but just hear these words as we enter into a time of, of worship and just proclaiming our love for the Lord in song. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. What a joy to be here in the midst of multiple generations, older generations, younger generations, some of you guys, kids in here. His faithfulness endures to all generations. Let's lift up his praise in song. for you. 
Let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. Let every heart adore, let every soul away. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down. Let's proclaim that he is holy as we sing.
you for your goodness to us. Thank you that what we're doing this morning, it's true, what we read in John 15, that we could do nothing apart from you, and yet in you we can, we can bear fruit from you. In you we can do what you've called us to do. And so, Lord, that's our desire. And so we just ask, would you come and have your way in us and make us a people, make us a church that follows after you and that the world would see you through us. So, Lord, do your work in us. Teach us this morning, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. We do want to welcome you here this morning. What a wonderful morning it's been already as we've been engaging in worship and uh, Lord... The Lord's presence is here among us, and how good it is to worship together, amen? Amen. Just a powerful, moving morning of being in the Lord's presence already, and now we get the the great privilege of opening His Word and asking Him to speak to our hearts. We're continuing in James. We're in James chapter 4. Last week, we had to kind of take a break at verse 5, and we're going to pick up verses 6 through 12 this morning. Kind of continuing this theme of check your ego. Do you have an issue of pride or are you living a life of humility? And how does that relate within the body? James has been speaking since the very first chapter as we got into that a couple months ago about the wisdom that comes from God and how God offers his wisdom to all who ask. And he gives it generously. And today we're going to look at a call to submission and humility. How does that play into wisdom? How does that affect our lives? And what is our response to what God is calling us to do? Wisdom is something that we all desperately need. And when we have godly wisdom, godly wisdom, when it's put into practice, when it's applied to our life, it leads us to a place of spiritual maturity. And remember, that's James's purpose as he's journeying through this letter, as he's writing this letter to these believers. His purpose is that these believers would grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ, that they would become more mature in their faith. He wants them to have a faith that works. Now, James is going to make a little bit of a transition here this morning as we pick up verses 6 through 12. He spent a considerable amount of time laying out the consequences of, of pursuing worldly wisdom. We looked at those, uh, those consequences and evidence of worldly wisdom the last few weeks. James has made it very clear that when you pursue worldly wisdom, these are the things that are going to result in your life. They saw that starting within the church. Last week we looked at there were quarrels and fights that were starting within the body. There's no place within the body of Christ for there to be fights among believers. And James says, yet this is what is taking place among you. You are fighting, you are quarreling, there's division, your tongue is ruthless, and we're seeing these things play out in your life. And it's because you're choosing worldly wisdom instead of following God and choosing his wisdom on how to respond to your situations. James says this is a huge issue. It's foundational to your relationship with Jesus. And it's placing you in a position where you're in direct opposition to God. You're in defiant opposition to God. And so the question for us this morning is, how do you live out your faith? How do you choose to live out your faith? For these believers that James is addressing, he's saying you're struggling with pride, you're struggling with sin, you're struggling with all these things, and it's keeping you from experiencing everything that God has for you, and it's ruining your life. It's greatly affecting and impacting the church. Uh, How do you live your life? And we're going to see this morning, James is calling us to a call of submission and humility. Let's pray this morning. God, how good it is to gather here together. And Lord, we pray that you would quiet our hearts. That as we open your word, Lord, that we would hear clearly what your word has to say. That anything that would hinder us from hearing, Lord, those distractions, those wayward thoughts, the anxiety maybe that we're carrying, that Lord, anything that would hinder us from hearing from you this morning, that those things would be pushed to the wayside, that our hearts would be fully attuned to what the Spirit is saying this morning. Open your words, speak to our hearts, challenge us, move us to a place of greater humility and submission 
to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our life. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're in James chapter 4, verse 6. There's this call to submission and humility. But I first want us to look at God's response to us. God's response to us. What is his response toward us? And it's very important that we remember the context of what James has been writing uh, to these believers about. There are all those conflicts within the church. They're facing trials and temptations. There's persecution. And they're choosing to respond out of sin. There are issues within this body. And James is calling them to submission and to humility. And he's calling them to repentance. But he says, first and foremost, you're doing all these things, but God. And so let's look at verse 6. James chapter 4, verse 6. But he gives us more grace. I want us to just stop right there before we even get on to the rest of verse 6. James has just laid out this case and this argument. It's been building for four chapters here. We're into chapter 4, and he says, these are the things that you're doing, and it's completely contrary to what God desires for you, but God gives us more grace. I want you to catch the impact of what James is saying. He says, you're a follower of Jesus. Jesus has laid his life down for you. He has given you godly wisdom. He has given you his spirit, and his spirit dwells in you, and your life is a mess because you're not choosing to follow Jesus fully. But God gives us more grace. And then he quotes a passage from the Old Testament. He says, that is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And James has just kind of laid down the gauntlet here for them. You are choosing the wrong way. You are choosing to serve the self. You are a very proud person, a very proud congregation. You're choosing your own wisdom over that of God's, but God gives us more grace. And that's why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, and he's going to lay out a case, that's you guys. But he gives grace to the humble, and the humble are those that seek God. But God gives us more grace. And the passage that James is quoting here is actually from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, where the Proverbs say, he mocks proud mockers. God mocks proud mockers. He's opposed to those who are proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And James, in this call to submission and humility, is going to lay out these things that the people need to respond to. But he first wants them to understand what God does and how God views them. He's saying if you're going to continue in this life of sin, if you're going to continue choosing worldly wisdom, you're going to find yourself in opposition with God. He says those that are friends of the world, those that are conforming to the patterns of this world, those that are a friend with the world are enemies toward God, and God's going to oppose the proud. He's not going to tolerate it. But if you choose submission and humility, God's going to give his grace. And his grace is far greater than anything that you've done. God's grace is far greater than any sin that you've been engaged in. God's grace is far greater than everything. Church, I want us to think about this for a moment because we try to control our own lives. And in many ways, in doing so, we declare that we don't need God. I think this was the situation that we find these believers in as James is writing to them. They've gotten to a place where they've got just enough Jesus that they feel they can call themselves followers of his. They've got basically fire insurance. You know, we're going to proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior. We're going to get the forgiveness of sins, and then we're just going to continue to live life the way we want. And so many times we try to live our life in a way that says we have ultimate control over everything. And subconsciously we say we don't, we don't need God. Things are going good. Things are going well. I don't need God at this moment. It's not until things get difficult when we start realizing, man, I've made a mess of my life and I can't do this. And then we call out to God because God's going to be there. He's going to help us. And then when things start going well, we start to live this pattern again that I can do things on my own. I can do things on my own. 
We try to control our own lives and we declare that we don't need God. We refuse to trust God in all things. And that's nothing more than the sinful display of our pride. Our pride is on full display. But there's something important for us to remember here. God gives grace. God gives grace. His grace is freely given toward all those who seek Him. But I want us to understand something about God's grace. His grace is not a permission slip to continue living in sin. And yet so many times we view God's grace as just that. It's a free pass to continue living in our life of sin. And James says it's time to make a choice. It's time to submit. It's time to humble yourselves before God and serve Him, to pursue Him, to pursue godly wisdom. Stop living life out of your own strength and power. Stop pursuing the wisdom of this world and pursue godly wisdom. Pursue Him. Live a life of submission to Jesus Christ, and God will give you His grace because His grace is more. Grace that God gives is not a permission slip or a free pass to continue living a life of sin, and yet so many believers view it as just that. Paul, in writing to the Romans in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Should we do that? Should we continue to sin so that God's grace, which is more, should just continue to come and increase all the more in our life? Paul says, by no means. What a ridiculous statement. What a ridiculous assumption that we can continue to sin and God's grace is just going to keep being piled on. No, he says, we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? You see, a follower of Jesus has died to self And it is not I who live, it is not you who live, it is Christ who lives in us and we've said no to the sinful nature and we've said yes to Jesus Christ. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. And James says, you've done all these things, but he has given more grace. And then a disclaimer, but God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. James is saying to these believers, I know you're facing intense situations. I know you're going through struggles. I know you're going through trials. I know you're facing difficulties, but you're choosing to sin. And God has offered you his wisdom in every situation. And he said, all you need to do is ask. All you need to do is ask and believe that God will give you his wisdom. Don't doubt. He'll help you deal with the pressure. He'll help you face the trials. He's given you his spirit to help you overcome the temptations. He's helping you to respond in love to one another. Choose this wisdom over this so-called wisdom that you're embracing. Choose godly wisdom instead of that wisdom you've relied on. But just so you know, God opposes the proud. And if you continue to live like this, you're saying that you don't need God and that you are really a proud person. And God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You're choosing to embrace and pursue worldly wisdom. And that's only highlighting, further highlighting your spiritual arrogance arrogance and pride. There's an old song that we've sung many times in years gone by, grace, grace, God's grace. Grace is greater than all our sin. Church, God's grace is freely given, and yet we have a response. We're called to action Here's the important reminder for us. God's word not only tells us the truth because it is the truth, but God's word also tells us how to apply the truth. In church, we need to move beyond just gaining information toward living a life of application. And that's what wisdom calls us to do. That we've got to take what we know, the truth of what we've heard, and we've got to live it out in our life. So we have God's response, and now we have our response to God. James is going to give us a list of commands, and it's going to be kind of rapid fire. He's going to go through this list rather quickly, and in verses 7 through 10, we're going to have 9, 10 commands, and we're going to combine some of them together, but he's going to go through this long list of commands, and there's a great sense of urgency to what he's saying. These are things that you and I ought to do. These are things that we ought to live out, and we have to have an urgency about it. We can't delay when it comes to this. This is our response 
to what God has done to us and how he responds to us. God has called us to a life of submission and humility. And when we respond in that way, his grace will come. His grace will come. It's greater than, far greater than anything that we've done. But we have to do something because Christianity, followers of Jesus, it's not a passive lifestyle. It's an active lifestyle of doing what his word says and applying it. So let's take a look at some of these commands. The first is this. We've got to submit and resist. We've got to submit and resist. Let's look at verse 7, James chapter 4, verse 7. James says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Stop living for yourself. Enough with the bitter envy and selfish ambition. Stop pursuing the worldly wisdom. Enough with the cutting words. Submit to God. Submission is not a word that we like to hear. We don't like to be in submission to others. Because it's taking control that we feel belongs to us and is giving it over to someone else. Submission, church, is a prerequisite which comes before we can obey any of the commands that James is going to list for us. We have to start with a life of submission. Church, we cannot obey God if we aren't first fully submitting ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We can't obey what God's Word says if we don't have a life of full submission. Full submission is coming under the control of Jesus in every part of our life. James says those that are proud, those that are proud are quick to ignore God's wisdom. They're quick to ignore godly wisdom. They resist submitting to God. There's an attitude of self-reliance and dependence on themselves only. James says if you're proud, you're going to struggle with submission to God. But the humble fully surrender and submit to God and they choose to obey him in all things. And James says, church, this is not an option. This is a command. You have to do this. You have to submit yourselves to God. Submit yourselves to God. Full submission to God leads us to actively being able to resist the devil. Resist the devil, James says, and he will flee from you. Resist means to to literally to stand firm, to set oneself against something. James says to stand firm against the devil. Set yourself against the devil. And you can only do this when you fully submitted, submitted and surrendered yourself to Jesus Christ. So many times we get this turned around. We resist what Jesus wants to do in our lives, and we find ourselves submitting to the devil. We say by our actions that we don't need Jesus, that we can do this on our own. We can handle our struggles. We can handle the temptations that come our way. We find ourselves doing everything in our own power to try to control our sin, but we realize pretty quickly that we cannot control our sin. We're not successful. We might have it under control for a little while, but soon that sin will come to the surface. Soon we can't resist the devil, and we start giving in to temptation after temptation after temptation, and it's not long until the sin starts to control us. Church, you will never be able to conquer the sins in your life and resist the devil if you have not fully surrendered in complete submission to Jesus Christ. You will never overcome the sin in your life if you're not fully submitted to Jesus Christ. We must resist the devil, but we can only do so when we find ourselves in submission to Jesus. Resistance requires us to actively pull away. It demands that we continually counter the lies of the enemy by reminding ourselves of God's word. One of the greatest ways that we can resist the devil and resist the temptations that come to us is by knowing and understanding and memorizing and applying God's word to our life. Psalm 119 says this. You guys know this verse? Let's say it together. I, well, let's together, that means like all at once. <laughs> all right, let's start over, okay? With enthusiasm, you guys are reading like you're just like, oh, so tiring, it's so hard to read. All right, with enthusiasm, I have hidden 
your word in my heart that I might not sin. What's David saying? I have hidden. I have memorized. I've meditated on it. I understand it. I've dissected it. I've chewed on it. I've thought through it. I've studied it. I know what the word says. I've hidden it here in my heart so that I might not sin against you. So that when I find myself in those situations where I'm facing difficulty, where I'm facing trouble, where I'm feeling tempted, where the enemy is coming and the devil is attacking and the arrows are flying, I know what God's word says. I've hidden it in my heart. I know it. I understand it. And I'm choosing to live it out. You see, it's not just the memorization and hiding the word in your heart and your head. It's the living it out and applying it to your life. And David says, I've taken your word. I've hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. That when the trials and the difficulties of this life come, I'm going to be able to stand firm. I'm going to be able to resist the devil. And he's going to flee from me because I'm standing firm on the word of God. And I've fully surrendered and fully submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ in my life. Church, that's how you overcome. You can't do it in your own strength. And James is talking to these believers saying, your life is a mess. The body is decimated. There's so much conflict and chaos within the body. You people need to choose godly wisdom. You've got to resist the devil, but you can't do that until you submit to Jesus Christ. We've got to submit to God and resist the devil. But the command comes with the promise. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resistance is an active response. It cannot be passive. The second command, the first part of verse 8, come near to God. Come near to God. Chapter 4, verse 8. Come near to God and he will come near to you. See, there were conflicts and fights within the church, and James is calling these believers to come back, to come near to God. He's calling them to come corporately together before God to seek his healing presence among them. And James is drawing on Old Testament. He's drawing on Old Testament imagery here, something they would know and understand being Jewish believers. He's calling them to come to the temple, the Old Testament imagery of coming to the temple to worship and offer sacrifices. Church, when we submit to God and we come together with the intent to worship and seek Him, God will come near to us. This is another command with the promise. Come near to God and He will come near to you. Church, are we corporately drawing together, drawing near to God with the desire in our hearts to worship Him and to seek His presence among us? Do we engage in worship? Do we engage with Jesus in our heartfelt worship do we come expecting the Holy Spirit's presence among us? Or do we just come on Sunday morning because, wow, this is what we do on Sunday morning. I know you're not getting up early to come see me. Are we coming with a desire to engage in worship, in heartfelt worship, with brothers and sisters in Christ coming to glorify Jesus, to worship Jesus, to proclaim his worth and his glory and his honor? And are we coming, are we coming expecting to meet with Jesus every time we gather? Do we expect that the Holy Spirit's presence is going to be among us working and moving James says, draw near to God. Come together. Come and worship. And when you come and worship and you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. His presence will be with you. Church, do we have a divine expectation in our worship and corporate gatherings that God will show up and that God will speak and God will move? The next command, wash and purify. He says, come near to God, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James says, wash your hands, purify your hearts, and he calls them double-minded again. He's using that, that symbolic language. He's using that, that imagery that they've gone back and forth between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom, and he's saying, wash your hands, purify your hearts. Again, this is that Old Testament symbolic imagery Preparation for worship and ceremonial cleansing. And his command here is highly reminiscent of what David says in Psalm 24. In Psalm 24, verse 4, David says in 3 and 4, he says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? 
Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol. You know, there's a song that we sing, give us clean hands, give us a pure heart. David's saying, who can come? Who can come into the presence of God? Who can come and worship? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to an idol. And James says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And there's this imagery that they are filthy with sin, that the fights and the quarrels and the divisions and the sinful desires battling within them has left them in a place where their hands are filthy, their hearts are impure, and they've been worshiping someone other than Jesus. And James says, it's time to come And prepare yourself. Wash your hands. Clean your heart. It's time to repent. If you're going back and forth between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom, you need to prepare your hearts. There needs to be a cleansing. Wash your hands. Purify your hearts. James is calling them to heartfelt repentance. You need to come back to Jesus. You need to come and worship fully, but before you can do that, you need to repent. You need to recognize the depth and depravity of your soul and you need to repent for all these things. You need to turn away from the sin that you're choosing and you need to walk in repentance and submission and fellowship with Jesus. And if we go back to verse 6, we do that, but he gives us more grace. Wash and purify. The next command is this, grieve, mourn, and wail. Let's look at verse 9. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. It seems intense of what James is saying here. And this is for a season, church. This is for a season. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. You say, wow, James is a little depressing here. Like, we've got to stop laughing in church and we've got to be gloomful. And it's just a season and it's talking about the sin in the heart. He says, grieve, mourn, and wail. You see, sin is no laughing matter. And yet, look at our society, where sin is openly embraced, and when you sin and you mess up, what's the response of many in our culture, and in our country, maybe even in our church? (laughs) My sin, that's not a big deal. You can overlook that, right? It didn't hurt anyone. And we have this response that sin is not a big joke. It's a big joke. It's not a big deal. And James says you you need to come to a place where you recognize the sin in your life, the sin in your body being the church, your sin in your community, the sin in your family, where you come to a place where you recognize the depth and depravity of what you've done and the depth and the pain that your sin has caused, and you need to find yourself in a place where you weep, you mourn, and you wail, and you grieve over your sin And the fact that Jesus Christ took that sin and he went to the cross and he suffered in your place and he took your sin. Church, if that doesn't move us to a place of inward reflection and a place of woe is me, what have I done? My sin, my sin has caused my Savior to die and to bleed. If you are not grieving over your sin, there's not been any true repentance. There's not been any godly sorrow. You are not living a life of submission and humility to Jesus Christ. You're living a life of pride. James says, weep, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Do you feel the depth of affliction? There's a a picture of being afflicted and miserable because of your sinful condition. Church, is this how you feel about your sin? Are you moved to a place of grief over your sin? Do you mourn over the sin that you've committed? Oh, how we, we should pray that the Holy Spirit would break up the hardened soil of our soul so that it becomes fresh ground for genuine mourning and repentance over our sins. Church, there's no room for a half-hearted response of, God, I'm sorry for my sin. While we continue to engage in it, there must be full repentance. 
not just for our sins, but the sins of our families, the sins of our church, our community, and those of our country. Friends, we need a fresh glimpse of the holiness of God. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Oh, how we need godly sorrow that will move us to a place of repentance. Do you mourn over your sin? James is leading these people through a season of genuine and heartfelt repentance. The next command that James gives us is this, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Friends, humility is not the call of the world. The glorification and exaltation of oneself at the expense of others is what the world calls us to pursue. My one brother has a, a saying that kind of goes along with this. He says, don't blow out my candle to make your candle look brighter. It's this whole idea of that I'm going to exalt and glorify myself. I'm going to make myself the center. James says, humble yourselves Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. It's a call to humility. It's the call and life of Jesus. Jesus is our greatest example of humility the world has ever seen. Jesus, who is fully God, he humbled himself and made himself nothing, taking on the very form of a man, becoming a nature, a servant. He humbled himself. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Friends, don't seek to glorify yourself. Don't seek to exalt yourself. Choose humility. Choose to become like Jesus in all things. Humble yourself before God. See, these believers in this church that James was addressing struggled with this. They wanted to make it about themselves. They wanted to glorify and exalt themselves. There was an issue of pride within their hearts. They look down on, we've looked at this in the early chapters, they look down on those who are less than themselves. They looked at the poor and the marginalized. They looked at the destitute and they said, I'm so glad I'm not like them. They exalted themselves. And James says, no, 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 that's the way of the world. I'm calling you to the way of Jesus. Jesus, who had every right, who, was, who is God himself, he humbled himself and he became Like us, he became a man. He was born as a baby. He grew as a man. He became a servant. He humbled himself to the point where he went to the cross for you and for me. That is our example. That is who we should follow. James says, humble yourselves. Verses 11 and 12, James is going to shift gears a little bit. He's gone through his list of commands. He's given us our response of what it should look like to God's response. And now he's going to give us one more warning. Seems like James is offering a lot of warnings. He really wants these people to understand what it is that God has called them to. And so he gives a continued warning here in verses 11 through 12. How do we treat one another? James says, brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? You see, the issue of speech and words had already been something James had addressed, and now he continues with a fresh warning against slandering one another. Slander in the body is completely uncalled for. Slander is talking negatively about someone else, speaking ill of someone else, speaking evil of someone else. It's cutting remarks meant to tear down and destroy. It's spreading lies and gossip. And James says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. You see, the world is already doing that to you You are called to love one another. You're to be like Jesus. You're to be humble like Jesus. 
And Jesus didn't use slander. He didn't use cutting words to tear down others. James says you've got to stop with the tongue. The tongue is destroying you. You're speaking ill toward others. A brother and sister in Jesus Christ, and you're tearing them down by your words. You're lying about them. You're speaking ill of them. You are gossiping about them, and there's no place for this. You're not better than they are. There's no room for this type of behavior within the church. Who made you to be judge and jury over your brother and sister? Who gave you permission to read into the law to strike down a brother with your words? James says, be careful because there is only one law and only one lawgiver and you are sitting, one judge, and you're sitting in judgment on both. Who are you to judge your neighbor? James references the Old Testament laws he did back in chapter 2, love God and love others. And slander is a violation of the Old Testament law. Speaking evil against others violates the kingdom command to love one another. It violates what God has commanded us to do. And there's no place in the church or among believers where we can continue to speak ill of one another. James has just commanded them to stop the quarrels and fights, to stop these things within the body, to manifest an attitude of humility. And church, if we are right with God, you know what? We'll be right with others as well. Pride gets in the way of both of those relationships. Slander, speaking ill of others, is the result of the arrogance and pride, jealousy, selfish desires, these things that James has been speaking about throughout his letter. Church, when we criticize a brother and sister in Christ, when we slander one of God's own children, I want you to think about those implications. Think about this. When we slander fellow believers, we are actually slandering a son and daughter of the King Most High. That alone should keep us from speaking ill of others. Why are we so quick to speak out against our brothers and sisters and sit in judgment against them? It all boils down to our sinful pride. James calls us to submit and live a life of humility in all things. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we come with a call to submission and humility. And Lord, it's a a powerfully convicting call. Because so many times we just think, well, this doesn't apply to me. But I sure know who it does apply to. So many times we think that we've got it all together. But Lord, your word is very clear. We're to submit to God. And it's really easy to see all the sin and all the struggles and all the mess and chaos in the life of these early believers and at times think it doesn't really apply to us. Lord, your word is alive and it's active and it's amazing because these things could have been written to us today because it fits so well of who we are. We pray, Father, that your word would continue to speak to us this morning. That your Holy Spirit would have complete freedom and reign in our body, in our lives, in our presence. To bring the conviction that may be needed. To move us to a place where there's a greater dependency on you. Complete submission to what Jesus wants to do in our lives. And that, Lord, it would be done with such humility that we recognize who we are and what you've done for us and that we desperately need you in all things. Develop within us, Father, a love for one another, a deep love for one another, a deep love for you, that we may be a people who are decidedly different because we follow Jesus wholeheartedly. Have your way among us, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing and respond and
You know, as we think of living our lives in submission to Christ, I think part of, part of that is understanding who he is, like Pastor James was saying, that he's holy and that he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And one day all of history is going to come into submission underneath his feet. Let's just rejoice in this truth and proclaim him as our king. darkness we were away without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt take that with us as we go. Praise forever to the King of Kings through our lips this morning and through our lives as we leave this place. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>